Check 1 2. Check 1 2. Good evening, this is VK3 EKH, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with the regular Friday night broadcast, <clears throat> coming to you from the studios of VK3 Charlie Sierra Juliet in Narry Warren South. We're broadcasting on prime frequency of 3541 kHz in the 80 meter amateur radio band lower sideband and transmitting simulcast on 1865 kHz amplitude modulation in the 160 meter amateur radio band. We're also streaming tonight on YouTube where you can find the, uh, the uh, live stream on the VK3 CSJ YouTube channel. We're also broadcasting via the Melbourne television repeater VK3 RTV digital channel number one. Good evening to everybody watching the TV missions. Um, we're also uh, got an active email address, vk3ekh at gmail.com, vk3ekh at gmail.com. So any reports from tonight's transmissions and like can be sent to that email address. I'm watching the inbox as we speak. Uh, we also have a Discord chat window uh, available for folks to uh, join into a little chat group and uh, carry on a conversation while I'm doing my thing that's okay the link to the discord channel can be found on the ASV website under the radio astronomy tab just go to the uh, link to the ASV radio broadcast and there's a little link uh, with a radio little radio dish telescope dish in it and that's the uh, discord channel uh, good evening to everybody <coughs> on this uh, 10th of June uh, in the year 2022 and the current temperature here is 8.9 degrees and I think there's a little bit of moisture in the air as well precipitation is another way of putting that Anyway, I uh, trust uh, everybody as well and that um, we've had a, a fine week thus far. Um, okay. All right. <laughs> See you all next week. No. Well, we've got a few things tonight, mostly uh, just uh, the usual uh, um, dialogue uh, news articles of various sort. No. Uh, no podcasts or a video footage to go by this week um, but we're working on the next project in the meantime as I'm trying to get um, 
some coffee down me. I haven't had coffee all day. This is my first uh, squig of coffee. So uh, <laughs> let me get used to that, hopefully. Anyway, um, yes, all right. Let me get into the swing of it. Um, we, I can see that we've got Martin, Kim, Graham, and uh, and uh, on the chat window so far, Martin VK seven JAH and Kim VK five FUSE. Get a Kim and Graham VK three GRK up there in good old Bendigo. <coughs> okay, briefly, if this can ever be done briefly. The Astronomical Society of Victoria was founded in 1922 and comprises just, I've got two cameras on me tonight, I've decided to activate the other camera. The uh, founded in 1922 comprises uh, over 1600 members uh, throughout Victoria and elsewhere. Membership of the society is open to all persons with an interest in astronomy. The Society's objectives are to encourage the study and practice of astronomy, to disseminate the knowledge of the science and to provide greater facilities for this study among its members. Monthly meetings are usually held on the second Wednesday of each month, which was just last Wednesday, except in January, the latter being held on a Saturday night. The meetings start at 8pm in the Morley Hall, National Herbarium, Burwood Avenue, Melbourne, near the Melbourne Observatory, which is not too far from the Shrine of Remembrance. Parking is available in Burwood Avenue, Dellsbrooks Drive and the surrounding streets. Admission is free and visitors are most welcome indeed. Privileges of membership include the right to borrow books, periodicals and other publications from the Society's extensive library which is located at the Melbourne Observatory in the old astronomer's office. Receipt of the ASV magazine Crux containing articles, news, observing notes and the like and the free provision of the astronomical yearbook. Access is available to telescopes on members nights held regularly at Melbourne Observatory and after the monthly meetings with a meeting per meeting. These instruments include the Society's 300mm Equatorial Reflector and a 300mm Portable Reflector. There's also a 200mm Refractor managed by the Royal Botanic Gardens and a Photoheliograph are also housed at the Observatory and are accessible as well. The Society also has a number of 200mm reflectors available for short period loan, so members can try before you buy. If I don't run out of time tonight, I actually have um, a, uh, a little bit on telescopes tonight, the kind of telescopes that are available, and if we can get through them all, there's about 10 telescopes in fact, which um, might be of some interest. Regular Society Club Night meetings are held on the first and last Fridays of each month at the Lodge, which is located in Burwood. Well, and there's uh, some plans afoot to change that uh, particular meeting location. Members are encouraged to use the Society's instruments located there to gain first-hand experience in telescope use. These instruments include a 508 equatorial reflector and a number of smaller reflectors. Members are also encouraged to make use of Society's country property located near Heathcote, some 90 minute drive north of Melbourne. There are a range of instruments available for members to use, and uh, the larger two only with appropriate training, which range from 300 millimeters to 1000 millimeters in aperture. Also located on the site is the 8.5 metre radio steerable fully telescope which members can access with involvement in the radio astronomy section. Members are encouraged to make and use telescopes. Advice and help on both matters are provided willingly to newcomers desiring to do the same thing. 
Instrument making is one of the number of common interest activities catered for within the society. Other areas of interest that members can participate in include deep sky observing, astrophotography, lunar and planetary observing, auroral meteor, comet, radio astronomy, computing, cosmology and astrophysics. Historical studies and research and astronomy in general are all catered for one way or another. Contact details for the various section directors are provided in the yearbook, which is... This is the yearbook I always read from every Friday night because I just haven't committed all that text to memory yet. <laughs> um, it's on the back cover. And uh, further information may be obtained by visiting the ASV website and notifications of events are given in the Crux Extra Bulletin sent out via email to members. Please note that the ASV will conform to all government health directives. ASV events may be required to be cancelled, moved or postponed. <coughs> Excuse me. The Secretary... Oh yes, for more information, you can write to the Secretary of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, GPO Box 1059, Melbourne, Victoria 3001. That's the Secretary, the Astronomical Society of Victoria, GPO Box 1059, Melbourne, Victoria 3, well, 3001, if you require it to be a written letter. Having said that, when, once you, of course, join the ASV, uh, you will receive a... Uh, members pack or information pack um, containing information so good old Australian Post is still used one way or another okay just getting the hang of switching cameras here <laughs> I'm over there now um, all right <laughs> now uh, let's see who do we have on our chat window we have Kim Cassiopeia g'day nebs uh, and that's about it. So the other two guys, that they're the only latest two that have joined. I've got to get used to which camera to look at, this camera. Um, all right. And of course, the TV up there, which has got the uh, output from the TV repeater on it. <laughs> um, where do we go to now? What is the first thing I've got here on my list to do? I think it's uh, continue on with Sky Notes from last week. But in this case, it is the, uh, oh, come on, bring it up, uh, the uh, dates. Uh, just a, a few more interesting dates to read out. <coughs> oh, don't give away yet. All right. Um, considering today is the 10th of June, let's kick off with what happened on the 10th of June in 2003. Uh, was the launch of Mars Exploration Rover Spirit which lands in 2004 and exceeds expectations operating to 2010. On the 13th of June was the 1983 Pioneer 10. 1983 Pioneer 10 becomes the first spacecraft to travel beyond the planets of the solar system. Also on the 13th of June was uh, in 2010 was Hayabusa, I think that's how you pronounce it, Hayabusa, in Japan. Uh, craft returns to the first returns with the first asteroid samples to Earth. On the 14th of June 1962, European Space Agency organization begins later to be a part of the European Space Agency ESA. European Space Research Organization ESRO begins later to be part of the European Space Agency, ESA. That's, I should have put a, a comma in there. Uh, on the 15th of June, in the year 763 BCE, uh, Isserians record a total solar eclipse which helps date f other events in the Mesopotamian history. I think that's how you pronounce that. On the 16th, of June 1911, a meteorite weighing 772 grams strikes a barn in rural Wisconsin, USA. Better look out here. Also on the 16th of June 1963, 
Valentina V. Tereskov in the USSR becomes the first woman in space in Vostok 6. The first civilian into space and only woman to undertake a solo space flight. On the 17th of June 1969, Verona 6 descends into Venus. Dense atmosphere sending data before it being crushed by the rising pressure of Venus. Good old Venus. On the 18th of June 1983, Sally Ride becomes the first American woman in space aboard the Shuttle Challenger. On the 20th of June 1990, the asteroid Eureka, found as part of the Trojans asteroid group, orbiting at Mars's La L5 Lagrange point. That's interesting. One more date. There's a few more there, but I'll leave the next week. One more date. On the 21st of June 2004, Spaceship One USA is launched as the first privately funded human space flight. This is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel with the regular Friday night broadcast. <clears throat> Coming to you from the studios of VK3 CSJ in Narry Warren South. Okay, first article for tonight is astronomer have discovered a mysterious object which is 570 billion times brighter than the Sun. Thank goodness it is far away. <laughs> there is a little bit of a uh, an image here which um, a bit of an artist's impression I think. Of course it is. It's, I don't have to think I know it is. But I'll bring it up on the screen. Let's see if uh, we can do this without the audio disappearing. And I'm still there. Okay, so for those watching YouTube and the TV repeater can see this particular image and because I am so image laden tonight uh, I would request that most folks listening on shortwave um, tune into YouTube. Have the volume turned down but just look at the pretty pictures on the, the HD YouTube channel. And of course for those watching TV repeater. Anyway, back to the article. 16 minutes past the hour. <clears throat> there is a massive ball of hot gas, billions of light years distant, that is brighter than than hundreds of billions of suns. <laughs> Sounds great, doesn't it? It's difficult to envision anything so bright. So what exactly is it? Astronomers aren't sure, but they do have a few theories. They believe it is a magnetar, a kind of supernova which is so strong that it pushes the energy boundaries of physics, or the most powerful supernova ever witnessed as of today. Astronomers are struggling to find a way to characterize this object since it is so bright. If it is a magnetar, it's as if nature took everything we know about magnetars and turned it up to 11, <laughs> said Christoph Stenick, a professor of astronomy at the I.O. State University and the team's co-principal investigator. The all-sky automated survey of supernovae, or assassin, is another way of putting that, uh, a compact network of telescopes meant to locate luminous things in the cosmos discovered the object first. This makes sense. Even though this object is very bright, it cannot be seen with the human eye since it is 3.8 billion light years distant. Since its inception in 2014, the assassin has identified approximately 250 supernovae. But this finding of Assassin 15IH stands out because it is a tremendous scale, of its tremendous scale. It is 200 times brighter than the typical supernova. 
570 billion times brighter than the Sun and 20 times brighter than all the stars in the Milky Way galaxy combined. <laughs> Strith. We have to ask, how is this even possible, you may ask, said Stanek. Uh, it takes a lot of energy to shine that bright, and that energy has to come from somewhere. Todd Thompson, an astronomy professor of at Ohio State, offers one theory. The exploration might have produced an incredible unusual form of star known as a millisecond magnetar which is a rapidly spinning and dense star with an extraordinary strong magnetic field. To shine as brightly as it does this magnetar would have to spin at least 1000 times per second and convert all that rotational energy to light with about 100% efficiency making it the most extreme example of a magnetar that is physically feasible. Given those constraints, Thomas said, we will, ever, we will ever see anything more luminous than this. Or he says, I should say, will we ever see anything more luminous than this? So the way you read the sentence, Clint. If it truly is a magnetar, and I'll, I'm just going to go back to, to camera here. Uh, there we go, back to the article. If it truly is a magnetar, then the answer is basically no. The Hubble Space Telescope will attempt to unravel this enigma in the coming months by allowing researchers to discover, or to observe, more like it, the host galaxy around this object. The researchers may discover that this brilliant object is located at a very core of a big galaxy, implying that it is not a magnetar at all, and that the gas around it is evidence of a supermassive black hole. In that, if that's the case, the intense light might be explained by a new kind of an event, according to research co-author Krustova Kochenek, an astronomer professor at the I.O. State. And he says, it would be something never seen before in the heart of a galaxy, and whether it is a magnetar, a supermassive black hole, or something totally else, the discoveries will almost certainly lead to new ideas about how things arise in the universe. I think there's something in that for everyone. Okay, <laughs> next article. Oh my goodness. Alrighty then. Uh, the next article is, you're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria. A very pleasant good evening to Steve, VK3 SPX, who's joined our chat window. G'day Steve. We also have Bill, VK3 KHT. G'day Bill, no doubt you're watching the TV. And we also have Bruce, CK3, Mike November. G'day, Bruce. Alrighty then. I already said that. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to get into the swing of it, guys. This next article from CNN, if you can believe them. Uh, well, it's, it's real. It's, an, it's good enough. It's a, an article on astronomy. Dated June 8, 2022, and uh, Andrew sent me this. G'day, thanks Andrew. Uh, a new unusual repeating fast radio burst detected 3 billion light years away. That's it. On to the next article. Uh, dear. Uh, okay, where are we? Um, where's this article start? Here. Astronomers have detected a mysterious repeating fast radio burst emanating from a dwarf galaxy located 3 billion light years away. The cosmic object is distinctive when compared with other detections of radio bursts in recent years, according to new research. Fast radio bursts, or FRBs, are millisecond long bursts of radio waves in space. Individual radio bursts emit once and don't repeat. But repeating fast radio bursts are known to send out short, energetic radio waves multiple times. Astronomers have been able to trace some radio bursts back to their home galaxies, but they have yet to determine the actual cause of the pulses. 
Learning more about the origin of these bright, intense radio emissions could help scientists understand what causes them. And there's a little image here, so I'll just bring up this image. <clears throat> this image that you are seeing on the TV right now is captured by the Carl Jansky Very Large Array in New Mexico. It shows the object Fast Radio Burst 190520 when it is active in the red. So that little red splotch you see in the middle of the screen there is this fast radio burst uh, caught in the radio wavelength range by the uh, very large array. Astronomers detected the object named FRB 190520 when it released a fast radio burst waves on May 20, 2019. The researchers used the 500 meter aperture spherical radio telescope or FAST in China and discovered the burst in the telescope data in November 2019. When they conducted follow-up observations, the astronomers noticed something unusual. The object was releasing frequent repeating bursts of radio waves. In 2020, the team used the National Science Foundation's Carl Jansky Very Large Array or VLA of telescopes to pinpoint the origin of the burst before zeroing in on it using the Superu telescope in Hawaii. Let's hope it wasn't overheating. Superu's observations in visible light showed that the burst came from the outskirts of a distant dwarf galaxy. A study detailing the findings published in the journal Nature on Wednesday. There's a little bit more to this article, but I'll just come back to me. Okay, um, two of a kind. The VLA observations also revealed that the celestial object can constantly release weaker radio waves between the repeating bursts. That's very similar to the only one other known repeating fast radio burst, FRB 1211.02, discovered in 2016. The initial detection and subsequent tracing of FRB 1211.02 back in to its origin point in a small dwarf galaxy more than 3 billion light years away was a breakthrough in astronomy. It was the first time astro <coughs> it was the first time astronomers were able to learn about the distance of environment of these mysterious objects. Now we actually need to explain this double mystery and why FRBs and persistent radio sources are found together sometimes, said study co-author Casey Law, staff scientist in radio astronomy at the California Institute of Technology. It's, is it common when FRBs are young, question mark, he asks, or perhaps the object that makes the bursts is a massive black hole that is mes messily, 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 it's it, messily. Oh, these Americans, they love to use words in their sentence making. Uh, the question is here from this particular bloke, Casey Law, he says, Is it common when FRBs are young, or perhaps the object that makes the bursts is a massive black hole that is messily eating up a neighboring star? Theorists have a lot more detail to work with now, and the scope for explanation is shrinking. Currently, less than 5% of hundreds of identifying fast radio bursts have been known to repeat only a few of them are gradually active. But FRB 190F, sorry, 190520 is the only persistently active one, meaning that it has never turned off. Since being discovered, said study author Dai Lai, Chief Scientist for the Radio Division of National Astronomical Observations of China and the Fast Operations Centre. Meanwhile, FRB 1211.02, the first unknown famous repeater, can turn off for months, Lai said. That's well, nearly finished. Oop. Um, okay, oh, there's an, I've got another picture here. Yep, there is one more picture here that I did grab. There it is. Oh, it's not there yet. Hang on. There. Oh, go ahead. Nope, what's it doing? Pause. No, what's it? Restart. There we are. Finally, got it. Um, so, new questions, new questions, new questions about all this. The 
latest findings raise more questions because now astronomers wonder if there might be two kinds of fast radio bursts. Are those that repeat different from those that don't? What about the persistent radio emissions? Is that common? Said study co-author that person who was in, involved in the study as a doctoral student at the West Virginia University. He said in a statement, or it might be a she, uh, it's possible that there are different mechanisms that cause these radio bursts, or that whatever produces them is behaving differently during various stages of evolution. Previously, scientists have hypothesized that the fast radio bursts are caused by the dense remnants left over after a supernova called a neutron star, or neutron stars with incredibly strong magnetic fields called magnetars. And the image you're seeing on the screen right now is, they say here, in this artist's concept of a neutron star with an ultra-strong magnetic field called a magnetar emitting radio waves in red. There it is. FRB 190520 is being considered as possible as a possible newborn object because it was located in a dense environment, Law said. That environment may be caused by material released by a supernova, which has resulted in the creation of a neutron star. As this material scatters over time, the bursts from FRB 190520 may decrease as it gets as it ages. Going forward, Lie wants to discover more fast radio bursts. A coherent picture of the origin and evolution of fast radio bursts is likely to emerge in just a few years, Lai said. Law, however, is excited about the impl implications of having a new class of radio wave sources, and that makes sense. For decades, astronomers thought that there were basically two kinds of radio source that we could see in our galaxies, in other galaxies, accreting supermassive black holes and star formation activity, Law said. Now we're saying that it can't be an either or categorization anymore. There is a new kid in the town, and it should be on the block, new kid in the block, and we should consider that when studying populations of radio sources in the, the universe. Oh my goodness me. All right. Mm, thank goodness that's over. Um, back to me. All right, you're tuned to um, ASV Radio, VK3 EKH. And this is a short article. Um, and we do have a couple of images for this too. Queen. Let me just bring up that image. Uh, where are we? Where's that image? There it is. <laughs> we go all holding here. What, what's, the, what's he saying? Queen. Um, okay. I think most people have learnt or discovered over time that Queen's guitarist Brian May explains how we discovered exoplanets in a new book called Bang. It's not exactly what I was going to say. But Queen guitarist Brian May is a qualified astrophysicist and uh, has been interested in astronomy for a long time and is quite um, uh, quite uh, well known as that, apart from being a, gay, uh, a guitarist in the Queen band, which I couldn't care less about Queen, to be honest. But anyway, um, yes, in this excerpt, Explore how the field of exoplanets has sprung up nearly overnight and what the wealth of new discoveries tells us about the worlds circling our sun. This picture you'll see on the screen, of course, it's a, uh, a made-up image. <laughs> Astronomers have found thousands of worlds circling other stars and many, book, and many look very unlike our own solar system familiar planets. And that's just kind of a an artist's impression there of a bunch of exoplanets but uh, anyway we'll just go back to me for the time being so we're carrying on with this article very very briefly um, I might add while astronomers have been explaining the origin and composition of our Sun's family of planets for hundreds of years this story has only come together in the last 30 years or so before then, astronomers assumed that the planets were born in the location and configuration in which we see them today. The idea of planets moving around while they are forming was only seriously considered once planets in, in, uh, once planets in other systems, exoplanets, had actually been found. Hot Jupiters 
1995, astronomers studying the nearby star 51 uh, Pegasi, 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 found that it appeared to be wobbling back and forth, movement that revealed itself through a regular pattern of Doppler shifts in the spectrum. The observations suggested that the star is in orbit around a position just slightly offset from its center. By measuring the size of the wobble, it was possible to get an estimate of the mass of the perturbing object, which turned out to be less than half the mass of Jupiter, too small to be a star. They had found an exoplanet. The discovery was puzzling. The new planet completed an orbit every 4.23 days. That placed this giant world, which we would have expected to find in the icy reaches of its solar system, outer solar system, seven times closer to its star than Mercury is to the Sun. To find a giant planet so close to its star that its year was measured in just a few days was completely unexpected, calling into question everything we'd assume about planetary systems. One such planet might have been an exception, the result of some glorious, unlikely freak accident of space formation. But hot Jupiters, like the like the planet uh, perturbing 51 Peg, were found to be common. More than 400 are known to date, and they account for about 10% of known exoplanets. This overstresses their actual abundance. It is easy to find large planet closer to its star there it will induce significant wobbles than to pick up to pick out the signal of a puny earth-sized world correcting for these biases hot jupiters seem to, to account for about one percent of all worlds and uh, that doesn't sound like much but it could easily mean that there are billions of hot jupiters in the milky way alone now getting back to uh, uh, brian may <laughs> The um, he's published a book. Oh, I've got a picture here of this too. Um, okay, uh, where is it? Where is it? There it is. This is all part of this article I'm reading, but I'm not going to read it all right through. Um, okay, so this is his book up on screen. Bringing bring the cosmos home, and uh, it's called Bang. Uh, our universe is vast, strange place where stunningly powerful phenomena abound. Bang! The complete history of the universe will take you to all the way from the Big Bang that birthed our cosmos through its cold, dark demise in an unimaginably distant future. Written for everyone with a curiosity about how we got here and where we're going, this highly anticipated update to a beloved best-selling book includes more than 20% new content. Each chapter dives into a different part of our universe's story, exploring the cosmos in depth in an understandable, approachable and compelling way. This new volume is expanded and retooled to cover the very latest advances in understanding of every aspect of astronomy, from a clear picture of the dark matter and dark energy that rule our ultimate fate to the plethora of extrasolar worlds now teaching us in detail how our own solar system and the life within it formed. Penned by rock star and astronomer Brian May, University Oxford astrophysicist Chris Lintott, planetary scientist Hannah Wakefield and beloved late Sir Patrick Moore, this updated edition is sure to become your go-to reference for all things cosmic. And that's where I'll leave that. <laughs> Oh, there is one more picture here. Yeah, let's let's just throw up a picture of Mr. May. There he is. Mr. May with his telescope at home, demonstrating how you can observe a sunspot um, from the sun by imaging on a piece of paper uh, at the rear of, or through the eyepiece of a telescope. And it's quite a good picture too, because you can quite clearly see not only Brian May, but the image of the sun with a sunspot on it. So isn't that magnificent? Alright, next article. Oh, we're getting on. How quick time flies when you're having fun. <coughs> uh, 
I'm going to make some jumps here, I think. And I can always go back if there's still time. <coughs> oh, excuse me, my voice is uh, going already. All right, this this is not exactly astronomy, but it's geoscience, sort of. Uh, but it's an interesting one because it's uh, an image taken from space, uh, looking back at Earth, and I shall um, bring up that image. Uh, it is, it is, it is, where is it? Uh, that one there. Okay, what are we, what are we showing? Okay, gargantuan Saharan desert plume blowing across the Atlantic is visible from space. That's what we're looking at. Dust plumes like this tend to suppress Atlantic hurricane activity. This is what I, I found interesting about this article. Dust plumes like this tend to suppress Atlantic hurricane activity and they also make for beautiful sunsets. June 8, 2022. The image you're seeing on screen, a dust plume stretching from the Sahara all the way across the Atlantic Ocean is seen in this image acquired by GO-16 environmental satellite on June 6. The plume was so predominant that it was also spotted by satellites stationed nearly a million miles away from Earth. As of June 6, this plume, or the plume stretched from Africa to South America and even reached Puerto Rico. All told, it covered more than 2.2 million square miles or 5.7 million square kilometers of the tropical Atlantic Ocean. It's expected to blow into the Gulf of Mexico by the weekend and cause dramatic sunsets in Florida and other locations. The plume was so large and distant that it was seen uh, by the Discover spacecraft stationed some 1,000, uh, 1.5 million odd kilometers from Earth. Really, is it that far away? Um, on average, the trade winds sweep an estimate 180 million metric tons of Saharan dust across the Atlantic Ocean to different parts of the Americas and Caribbean basin every year, so the phenomenon is not all that unusual. Scientists call it um, scientists call it the Saharan layer air layer. The cell SAL is characterized by a mass of very dry, un, uh, um, exceedingly dusty air that forms over the Sahara Desert during late spring, summer, and early fall, and frequently sweeps out into the Atlantic. Cell activity typically ramps up in mid-June and peaks from late June to mid-August with a few outbreaks occurring every three to five days. According to Jason Duan, a University of Miami hurricane researcher, during this period, peak period, cell outbreaks often reach as far west as Florida, Central America and even Texas and they can cover areas of the Atlantic as large as, 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 large as the lower 48 United, United States. Uh, and I've got one more image here. Uh, this one here. Uh, take it. Oh, I don't know why it's doing that. Oh, come on. Just trying to get it to take it. There it is. Um, all right. In 2020, uh, at late June event, was so enormous that it was dubbed the Godzilla dust plume. It intruded into the southern United States where on June 27 it raised the concentration of fine particles PM 2.5 PM to a level exceeding the EPA air quality standard in about 40% of stations in the south. Uh, Will the current plume go to rival Godzilla? Question mark. That remains to be seen. One thing is sure: Saharan plumes blowing across the Atlantic suppresses hurricane activity. This is what I found interesting: uh, Saharan plumes like these blowing across the Atlantic suppresses hurricane activity. What happens? The warm air layer tends to quell updrafts of moist air that are key to storm formation. In addition, by shading the ocean, the dust can help keep sea to surface temperatures down. Warm sea, warm sea waters fuels storms. Warm sea water fuels storms. So this tends to suppress them, and any f storms that do manage to form are prone to being ripped apart by the strong winds associated with the Saharan air layer. 
or the SAL. So that was interesting. I just thought I'd throw that into the mix um, to tonight. All right, I'm going to go into this telescope article now because I'm just not too sure how long this will take me to go through because we are dealing with 10 telescopes. Have you ever wondered what telescope to buy? All right. Let me see how we go here. This is June 7, 2022, courtesy of astronomy.com news. Um, okay, let me see, let me see, let me see. There is a picture here. This is the thing I'm, I'm looking for. It's just a kind of a, a generic image. Uh, the best telescopes for beginners who want to view planets, galaxies and more. If you're new to observing, you don't need to buy the most expensive telescope, just the one you'll use the most. And I've mentioned this before, but you can always start out with a pair of binoculars. Anyway, the article continues on by saying, May you have had a casual interest in astronomy for years, looking up at the night sky every chance you get. Or maybe you have just recently become interested in the wanderers hanging high above our heads. Either way, you have decided to take the next step and get your first telescope. Thumbing through astronomy pages, you see many that are intriguing. But at the same time, you're baffled. What kind should you get? How much do you really have to spend? Which is the best for you? These are all important questions that you need to answer before purchasing a telescope, whether it's your first scope or tenth. This overview will help shed some light. Pardon the pun. Some hard questions. Before you decide which tele type of telescope to get, you need to take a hard look at your situation and ask yourself the following questions and be honest with your answers. <clears throat> what is your budget? While you may feel some sticker shock then you, when you look at a telescope prices, the good news is that you do not need to spend a small fortune purchasing your first telescope. You can get a very nice instrument for just under $300. If, you, but if your budget is a bit higher, you can purchase a, a well-equipped instrument for $1,000 to $1,500. But avoid the urge to go straight to a high-tech telescope immediately. While they are tempting, many newbies find them daunting to set up and use. Where will you use it? Question mark. Well, this might not be the first thing you think of, but it's critical in deciding what kind of telescope you get. You will be using your telescope from home, or will you be using your telescope from home, uh, where you set it up in your yard for a, a night under the stars, or do you have do you need to drive a good distance to view the sky properly? If your location of choice is hours away, then look for telescopes that are quick and easy to set up, and for those driving to a location, double check that it will safely fit into your car before purchasing. Where will you store it? Question mark. This is an issue that many amateurs don't consider. Ideally, your scope should be easily accessible and stored in an unheated but clean location. Keeping it at ambient outdoor temperature will speed the optics acclimatization, acclimatization to the night air. Something along those lines. By contrast, bringing a scope into the cool night air from a heated home will cause images to blow due to heat currents in the tube before the components stabilize. Storage will also play a major role in the scope in the size of the scope you choose. For instance, you must if you must carry it down a flight of stairs, it should be compact and light enough not to create a fall hazard. Types of telescopes. <coughs> Let me just uh, go back to uh, camera. Okay, just go back to the article. Types of telescopes. Today, astronomers use one of the three basic telescope designs. 
the refractor, the reflector, and a hybrid design called the catadioptric. Dioptric. Cata, catadioptric. <laughs> Cata, I, I tried practicing this before, and I, I think I got it right, but there it is. I tripped over it straight away. Catadioptric. That one. Refractors are recognizable by their long slender tubes. A large objective lens sits in the front while the observer looks through an eyepiece at the back. Changing the eyepiece will change the telescope's magnification. Reflectors, on the other hand, don't have a lens up front. Instead, they use a large concave primary mirror located near the bottom of the tube to gather light from a target and bring it into a focus. The most popular type of reflector among uh, amateurs is the Newtonian. Light reflects from the primary to a small flat secondary mirror tilted at 45 degrees. The light then bounces off the secondary and through a hole into the side of the front of the tube into an eyepiece. Finally, the catoptric telescopes Combine both lenses and mirrors. Light first passes through a large front lens called the corrector plate and on toward the primary mirror at the back of the tube. The corrector plate reduces or eliminates apparition caused by the mirrors. After bouncing off the primary, the light reflects towards a secondary mirror at the front and then back through a small hole in the, pro in the, in the middle of the primary and into an eyepiece. So which telescope is right for you, you must ask yourself. That depends on your answer to the earlier questions as well as where your interests lie. If you crave sharp, highly detailed views of the bright sky objects such as the moon, planets, double stars and sprinkling of star clusters, then a refractor is ideal. They, become, they come in apertures ranging from 2 to 6 inches or 5 to 15 centimetres. Smaller models are perfect for anyone who prefers extreme portability. Think scopes you might bring on a family camping adventure or is looking for a quick grab and go instrument to run outside with uh, on a given clear night. If however you prefer hunting for faint fuzzies such as nebulae and galaxies then a reflector is the better choice. Dollar for dollar, reflectors offer the largest aperture for the in investment. These instruments range from 3 to 25 inches, 7.6 to 64 centimeters in size and if you want to spend the money you can even get a larger custom-made scope. Finally if you want a reasonable large aperture but uh, at the same time need a portable uh, need portability to travel to dark skies, then a catadioptric <laughs> is a greater choice. These apertures run between 3 to 16 inches or 7.6 to 41 centimeters. And what about the mounting concerns? How do you mount this telescope? Just as important as the kind of telescope is the type of mount you use to support it. A good mount must be strong enough to carry the telescope's weight while minimizing vibrations. Altitude azimuth mounts um, move both in azimuth uh, or left or right and in altitude up and down. Many are simply aimed by hand while more elaborate models feature com computerized aiming and tracking systems. A popular variation of azimuth al altitude azimuth mounts turns a Newtonian telescope into what's called a Dobsonian telescope. Dobsonians are simply Newtonian reflectors situated on a mount that moves up and down in elevation and pivots in azimuth like a lazy Susan. Most are aimed by hand although some are tricked tickled tricked although some are tricked out with computerized drive systems. Why is it tricked? Anyway. Alternatively, many telescopes come on equatorial mounts. These mounts compensate for the Earth's rotation by keeping on the rotational axis parallel to Earth's axis of rotation. Because of this, the mount can stay easily fixed on a celestial object just by moving one axis at a constant speed. The two most popular designs among amateur astronomers are the German equatorial mount and the fork 
mount. Both are widely available from and with computerized aiming and tracking systems. Many amateurs prefer equatorial mounts, but bear in mind that some mounts, especially the German equatorial type, can be much heavier than the az azimuth mounts. And then they go into a, a, a number of suggestions here. Um, don't know if I'm going to have time for all that. <laughs> um, dare I say that what I will say, there's 10 telescopes here. Mm -mm. And uh, what I'll just do um, is uh, just, I, I was going to try and describe both all of them, but I, I just haven't got time to do that really. <clears throat> uh, but I'll just show you quickly for those watching the TV. Um, I am having problems with this. I don't know why, but there we are. There's, uh, there's one telescope. Um, let me see. It's a uh, refractor. It's, a, it's called a Celestron Astromaster. It's a four inch uh, telescope. <clears throat> uh, the next telescope is a, a Stellar View SVX 102D. Um, the next telescope is a, um, it is called an Explorer, Explorer Scientific First Light, AR127. <coughs> the next telescope is a, hang on, let me select it, uh, is a, uh, a Teleview 85 which is uh, for those that are looking for a grab-and-go telescope. It's a 3.35 inch uh, aperture. Uh, the next uh, telescope is uh, a reflector and it is a um, one of these guys. <laughs> uh, it is a Celestron Star Sense Explorer, a DX13AZ, a DX12, a long distance it must be, a DX. <laughs> 130AZ. It's a it's 5.1 inch uh, telescope, Newtonian. Nice telescope too. That'll do uh, be good for you. Um, the next telescope is um, where are we here? Um, I'm, I've got that one on screen, so it must be that one there. Uh, so the next telescope is this one. It's a Orion Skyview Pro 8. It's an 8 inch telescope. If you're serious about uh, observing the sky, planets and uh, and uh, uh, extra galactic uh, or deep sky objects, um, I, I would suggest that this, this telescope on screen right now would be probably your first uh, choice um, if you're prepared to spend the money on this one. Uh, but uh, it's an 8 inch telescope and I think 8 inch uh, is about a, a good starting size for uh, looking at, at planets and, uh, and distant objects particularly. Um, yeah, uh, so the next uh, telescope is the Skywatcher Classic 200P, which is this guy, and um, it's uh, called a Skywatcher. Yep, uh, a Sky a Sky a Skywatcher Classic 200P, a basic Dobsonian, which delivers a lot in an affordable price. It all is also an 8-inch uh, primary mirror telescope, ideal again for faint uh, galaxies, clusters, and nebula. Um, it all depends on what eyepiece you use in these sorts of telescopes. To be honest, uh, this is now this is the word that I'm tripping over. I might, I'm not sure if it's on the picture here. Um, I don't think it is. Um, uh, which? Oh, hang on. Let me go back to the article. I'm picking on this one here. Okay, so it's this one. <coughs> uh, hurry up. Do your thing. There it is. All right. So this one here. Yeah, is that on the screen? No, it's not. The word's not on the screen. Catadioptrics. 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 Hmm. Anyway, that's the telescope there on the screen. It's got these unique uh, optics. And uh, that one there is uh, called a, an Explore Scientific First Light. It's 100 uh, mask, masks of cassocrane. It is a 3.9 inch, 10 centimetre uh, compact telescope, ideal uh, for, um, um, I think, for basically for just about anything really. <laughs> and uh, I think this is the last telescope here. Uh, it's a Mead. 
and uh, let me bring that up on the screen I hope most of you guys are watching the YouTube feed um, okay so this one here we've got on screen is the Mead uh, ETX 125 Observer uh, Max Mastoff Cassegrain it's a Cassegrain telescope and uh, its um, aperture is 5 inches uh, using an equatorial dual fork um, nice compact telescopes easy to transport and uh, deliver good uh, good results you can fit cameras to all these sorts of telescopes um, but particularly the ones that are computer controlled that track uh, objects and uh, actually the, there's one more image here this this telescope um, that I've got on screen right now this one's called a Celestron Nexstar 8SE a Celestron Nexstar 8SE the, the Nexstar features a legendary Celestron 8 telescope uh, and on a one-armed computer controlled mount and uh, it is also an 8 inch uh, mirror in it and uh, that's also a, a, a good good telescope to get you can't go wrong with a scope like that uh, as well for for doing some basic uh, observations of the sky so I thought I'd just quickly uh, run through uh, a lot of those uh, telescopes that are available you if you want to um, uh, follow up on that article it's a uh, it is on uh, uh, where do I read that from uh, astronomy.com there it is um, astronomy.com it's called the best telescopes for beginners who want to view planets galaxies and more it is published Tuesday June 7 so it's just a few days ago and you look under the news tab uh, for that article if you want to follow it through yourself because there's a lot more information about the telescopes each telescope has a, a reasonable um, a write up on it I mean nothing too detailed but enough to give you a bit of an idea best thing I can suggest though uh, is that when it comes to choosing uh, or wanting to choose telescopes of course is to uh, go to a, a dark sky night uh, the um, the Astronomical Society of Victoria has uh, throughout the year uh, a number of um, dark sky nights where the public can go up and uh, visit the site for the first time and uh, and um, get a chance to look through uh, a variety of telescopes uh, there's even a, a pair of stereo uh, binoculars to, uh, for astronomy very big large uh, binoculars that you can look through uh, and uh, ask questions to uh, to the astronomers there and they'll be happy to uh, give you um, uh, a good uh, educated uh, response um, all right uh, and there are numerous places around Melbourne that sound telescopes that sell sell telescopes sightings uh, uh, sidereal trading is one that comes to mind straight away up there in telemarine area just to pick a name out of the top of my head to the guys if they're watching uh, all right now let's go through spaceweather.com uh, the solar wind is currently at 307.7 kilometers a second at a density of 16.57 protons per cubic centimeter the disk of the Sun which I have the image here somewhere there it is um, that is the current uh, disk of the Sun more or less with only uh, one sunspot on it at the moment but there is a second sunspot just coming on the rim uh, in the image but the uh, only sunspot that's been given a designation is AR3029 uh, so the sunspot number to date is 17 and the radio sun the radio flux uh, is currently 106 solar flux units measured at a wavelength of 10.7 centimeters I might also mention that um, uh, amateur radio station VK3 Fox Sierra uh, VK3 FS uh, if you type in Google search engine for uh, that station VK3 FS he has a, a very interesting website on a lot of solar activity the latest solar activity a lot of graphs and a lot of uh, information uh, that he's got uh, graphed on various pages on his website um, which kind of the, the emphasis is to do with uh, um, e-layer uh, propagation and um, uh, 
uh, and and that sort of thing. But uh, a lot of information is there on uh, his uh, website. Just thought I'd plug that in. Uh, more new sunspots. As predicted two days ago, a new sunspot group is merging over the sun's northeastern limb. Uh, the group of three spots is crackling with C-class solar flares. I love the way they use terms like crackling. <laughs> um, okay, and uh, there are also, if you haven't seen Mercury, I think this is the time for seeing it. Good morning, Mercury. Uh, since June began, uh, four bright planets have been lined up in the morning sky. Um, Mercury just joined the show. And uh, so if you haven't seen Mercury uh, at all, here's your chance to, uh, to be able to see Mercury. I th think, uh, I don't know whether it's in the morning. It, it, this is in, in the Northern Hemisphere. They say Northern, uh, they say morning uh, sky, but I think it may be in the afternoon sky here. I'm just going to check sky notes very quickly. Um, Mercury. Mercury will at last become into view from mid-month when it will rise just before dawn. Okay, so it is, sorry, I got completely mixed up there. Uh, so yes, um, so Mercury is now visible from about 5.30 a.m. before sunrise. So if we've got a clear sky, uh, you'll see Mercury uh, uh, just be, uh, above the horizon before um, the sun rises there. So it'd be yeah, interesting to, if you're out there running uh, a runner early in the morning. <laughs> All right, uh, I think that's about it. Um, I'm sure there's more there. Hang on a second, let me go back to uh, the picture. <sighs> Struth, camera. Okay, back there. And sky notes. Uh, no, not sky notes, uh, space weather. Uh, so, 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 so. Um, as of June 10, 2022, there are 2,279 potentially hazardous asteroids. And that's all the information I can glean from uh, spaceweather.com of interest and of any value. The Aurora Australis is extending out towards the mainland. There is a fairly substantial auroral ring of activity over Antarctica as we speak. Um, but I don't know whether it's enough for auroral watchers to actually see anything in the southern sky. Uh, maybe from Tasmania? down to the, the low end of Hobart, maybe you'll see something. Uh, but the uh, auroral ring over Antarctica at the moment is very green. So <laughs> so it's looking quite healthy at this stage. Okay, I had to skip a few articles there. I knew the telescope thing would uh, go on for quite a while, but there it is. So on that note, uh, I shall conclude the session for tonight. Thanks everyone for uh, uh, tuning in and, and listening to uh, the various uh, stories tonight um, we shall uh, be back next Friday to do it all again uh, any signal reports please send to I don't have it's the first time I've looked at it it's the email box inbox um, okay so I can see three emails up there we usually average about three emails a month turn on mouse uh, we've got an email from Don uh, G'day Don, VK3HDX. He reports an excellent signal on 160. Yep, the usual great uh, report there on AM. And uh, Andrew, VK3KIS, reports uh, listening on 80 meters with a good signal. And we also have Stuart. Yes, it is. G'day Stuart, um, VK3UAO calling in. Uh, good evening, and the northern suburbs of Melbourne, no worries. Thanks, uh, Stuart. Thank you very much, Lee. All right, so that's it. And uh, <laughs> and uh, to all the folks that uh, have called in on the chat window, uh, Nebs and uh, Martin, VK7JH, Kim, VK5FUSE, uh, Joe, VK3BKI, g'day, Joe. Um, Bruce VK3MN, Graham VK3GRK, who will probably call in, and uh, Bill VK3KHT, and I think that's about all I can see there. So they've all been chatting amongst themselves. 
Okay, this is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, broadcasting since 1988, concluding transmissions on 160 metres, our medium wave surface, and uh, uh, thank you for stations listening there. Um, anybody who has been listening to the AM signal would appreciate uh, signal reports uh, from afar and uh, how well it was heard. So, uh, all information about the Society can be found at www.asv.org.au and go and explore the website. This is VK3EKH with VK3CSJ on the microphone concluding transmissions on 1865. Thank you for listening. Stations on 80 metres, please stand by for our callback call as such. This is VK3EKH. All right, and that rests the linear cooking away there behind me. Um, yep, that's it. Band noise. <laughs> All right, so where's my notebook? There it is. And um, we had quite a good turnout on the coffee break net this morning. At 11 o'clock, we had... Um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 12 AM stations on the Coffee Break Net tonight, this morning, 18.25. Just thought I'd mention that. All right, so this is VK3 EKH listening on 3541 kilohertz for any stations wishing to check in. Okay, it sounds like the band might have dropped out a little bit there. Uh, VK3BDA, VK3KIS, VK3HDX, VK7JAH, and VK3KHT. Is there any other stations there? Uh, QRZ again, VK3 something something. Sierra Papa X ray, okay. VK3 SPX. Hmm. Uh, all right. We'll go to the top there. G'day, Graham. VK3 Bravo Delta Alpha, who's the, that's the official call sign for the Bendigo District Astronomical Society. Have a say, Gray. VK3 BDA, VK3 EKH.
<coughs> yeah, thanks, Graham. VK3 BDA. Uh, are you at home or uh, running portable somewhere? Just out of interest. Yeah, okay. VK3 BDA, VK3 EKH. I just, um, yeah, there's just something about different about your signal. Uh, although it's been a while since I last heard you, but uh, you don't sound as strong as you normally uh, would. Uh, I think you're normally stronger. And uh, um, I don't know, the audio sounds a little little nasally. So <laughs> I just, it might be my hearing. So just ignore me, uh, Graham. Um, but yeah, good to hear you. Thanks very much for calling in. Uh, really good to, uh, to see that you're uh, still out and about. And um, um, <clears throat> and uh, yes, it's it's good that the the um, the, the astronomical the Bendigo Astronomical uh, District Astronomical Association Sci uh, Society <laughs> is uh, is st is doing well. It has become a um, uh, a section of the ASV some time ago, um, uh, but uh, they m utilize the dark sky site uh, up at Heathcote to quite a bit. Uh, and um, and uh, do some good things. So uh, yeah, no, good on you, Graham. And thanks for uh, calling in. Um, okay, uh, Andrew VK3KIS. Thanks for sending us the article too. VK3KIS, VK3EKH. Yeah, thanks, uh, Andrew. VK3KIS, VK3EKH. Very good. Um, yeah, like the, the same here. I um, I think with this current, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> once we got into winter, uh, I think the weather is just completely switched to bad weather every day. The amount of cloud cover uh, that we've had, uh, anything uh, astronomical, any uh, you know, use of telescopes has just been a uh, a no show. So. Um, uh, I think I've seen the moon uh, between the clouds there just a, a handful of times in the last uh, uh, few days, but uh, it very quickly disappears behind the uh, behind the the clouds. So, yeah, winter. Th I think winter this year is going to be very cold and wet, and not not certainly not conducive of uh, of doing any kind of astronomy. Although it all depends on where you are, and uh, uh, often if you're uh, living on the the northern side of uh, the Great Divide. Um, you know the top part of uh, Victoria. Often the weather uh, pattern in uh, northern Victoria there can be quite different to uh, to what we have down here in uh, in, in Melbourne. So uh, yeah, it just depends on what side of the Great Divide you are on. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. Thanks very much for tuning in. Uh, next on the list is Don VK3 HDX VK3 EKH.
Good on you, Don. VK3 HDX, VK3 EKH. Does that mean that you're actually moving out of Melbourne? Uh, okay, cool. No worries at all. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, you're not the only person who's uh, moved uh, out of Melbourne in recent times. <laughs> uh, not me, but um, uh, one of our other ham radio friends, uh, Dave, vk 3 ase um, who's lived in Melbourne for most of his life, uh, has uh, now moved to uh, northern Victoria. And um, I don't know, he might even be listening tonight, but... Uh, uh, good on you, Dave, for getting out there onto uh, uh, a nice uh, large property of land. It's uh, it's a beautiful looking location uh, up there, and um, I know if I was the one moving uh, out there, I'd be pretty pretty happy because of the uh, quiet uh, RF noise location that it is, but also the uh, the clarity of the sky. Um, getting out of Melbourne uh, would enhance the uh, the view of the sky. Uh, um, many many times so um, I don't know whether I'll ever get there I don't think so it depends what happens to this property where I'm, I'm living at the moment if my um, if my uh, niece and her husband uh, my nephew-in-law um, decide to sell this property at some stage in the future that's that's where I'll have to consider what uh, what I'm, I'm gonna have to do but uh, I don't know the the future is a little unclear at this stage but at this stage for all intents and purposes we're going to be here in Narry Warren South for a, a while to come uh, enough of that rubbish all right <laughs> thanks Don thanks for, very much for uh, the report um, and like I say that that article about the telescopes uh, can be found on the, the astronomy.com uh, website Bill VK3KHT VK3EKH VK3 KHT, VK3 EKH. Uh, I think I skipped over Martin too, by the way. Hang on, Martin, I'm coming to you next. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks, uh, um, uh, Bill. Uh, much appreciated uh, uh, calling in. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a, um, it de all depends on where you're located when it comes to 160. Um, I, uh, I know that I can put a, a pretty good signal up into Batemans Bay, uh, up into. Uh, New South Wales there, uh, but locally uh, the uh, um, it can be a bit of a struggle. But I, I know that probably you know probably out to about uh, 50 kilometres from here, uh, the uh, uh, what there is of ground wave would probably be working quite well for me. And uh, and then of course we're uh, on to any kind of uh, uh, skip uh, that might occur or is occurring. But uh, yeah, anyway, thanks, uh, uh, Bill, and um, I, I know you're watching the, the, the TV too, so uh, good stuff. Uh, now, I skipped uh, Martin, so back to you there, Martin. You were, you were meant to be <laughs> before Bill on my list. VK7JAH, VK3EKH.
Thanks, Martin. Not a problem, dear sir. VK seven J A H launch system VK three C S J. Very good. Uh, e K H. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, uh, uh, Martin. Yeah, you're coming through. Five and nine. I'll give you a five and nine. Uh, so um, there it is. Um, but uh, thanks for the uh, the quick report calling in and coming up on the chat window and saying good day to everybody there too. Uh, now the last station to call in. I'm not sure if I got your call sign right or not. But we'll, we'll, I think it was a Sierra Papa X-ray. I'm not sure about that S part. VK3 Sierra Papa X-ray. I think it was an S. VK3 Sierra Papa X-ray. Uh, go ahead. This is VK3 EKH. Yeah, no worries. Uh, can I? <clears throat> you might have mentioned it. I might have missed it. Can I grab uh, your name? What was your name again? Go ahead. Uh, Steve, was it? Yeah, good day, Steve. VK three SPX. Uh, VK three EKH. Yeah, yeah good day, Steve. Nice to uh, catch up with you again. Uh, not, um, not that I can quite remember when we uh, caught up, but um, uh, it's it's been a while since I've been up at the uh, the. Um, uh, the dark sky side and all the radio astronomy installation uh, but um, uh, I um, when was the last time I was that I can't even remember now <laughs> um, the, the the whole COVID situation over these last uh, couple of years have really uh, thrown a, a spanner in the works uh, for a, a lot of us and a lot of things uh, but particularly what we were planning on doing up at um, uh, uh, up at the radio astronomy installation but that's now all taking shape there's uh, a, a new section director and he's uh, taking the uh, uh, um, the horn the horse by the reins what's the expression anyway he's <laughs> it's fresh blood so to speak so um, uh, he's got a, a fairly uh, a positive vision for uh, moving the uh, radio astronomy section along so um, lots of things are going to uh, uh, start occurring with the uh, eight and a half meter telescope over these next 12 months I'm sure um, but um, I'm not certain when I'll be heading up there next but uh, my my I, I still have well I, I've got a super that's been overheating and uh, I think we've found the problem and uh, uh, I need to do a bit of a test drive just to uh, double check uh, that it's uh, going to survive the two and a half hour drive to uh, to Heathcote but um, uh, I think it'll be okay. We, we did a, a bit of a, a modification to the uh, thermostat. Seems to have fixed the problem. Anyway, <laughs> like we, re we removed it. No, we didn't remove it. We had to fit it back. That's another story. Anyway, is there any other stations wishing to check in for tonight? VK3 EKH. Okay, I heard VK5 FUSC, very weak, VK3 VAT, and there was one other station. Of course. <laughs> All right, uh, now, uh, Kim, you're a bit weak, but we'll give it a go. VK5 FUSC, VK3 EKH.
as he put it back to me. Or I think he's put it back to me. Uh, VK5 FUSE. VK3 EKH. Yeah, look, very hard copy tonight, uh, Kim. Uh, I heard. I think all I picked up was that uh, the signal report from me was good. I think he said I was about 5 and 9. Uh, doing about 5 and 9, which is... Uh, well, you can't complain with that report. Um, but, um, yeah, unfortunately not uh, not as strong uh, into Narry Warren South. So, um, never mind, Kim. Uh, we've got you on the on the log. And... Um, and of course, uh, lots of interesting, <coughs> lots of interesting topics on the screen there. So, <laughs> all very good. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, uh, Kim. Now we've got a, a local amateur. Um, I'm not sure if he's running um, um, what power he's running, but uh, anyway, have a say, Tony, quickly. VK3 VAT VK3 EKH. Yeah, thanks, Tony. VK3, VAT, VK3, EKH returning. No worries, Tony. Yeah, you're not uh, you're not uh, not as strong as I would imagine you should be, but uh, you're about 20 over 9. So uh, being a station that's only about 2.5 uh, kilometres away from me, so uh, you really should be pinning the needle. But it doesn't matter. I can hear you. So that's uh, it's the main thing. Thanks, Tony. And uh, you will, we can hang around for a little while. I don't want to be uh, too long uh, uh, up here. Um, okay, uh, Ian, VK5KKT, Two Worlds, VK3EKH. Good on you, NVK5, KKT, VK3, EKH returning. Uh, yeah, it's still around 8.4 degrees here outside. 8.4, and uh, the uh, humidity is about 94%. My uh, my rain gauge is a bit blocked at the moment, so I can't um, I can't tell you how much rain has fallen today. Uh, I've got a hopefully I'm, I'll be able to get that unblocked this weekend. Uh, but uh, that's uh, another story. Thanks, uh, Ian, for calling in and um, and uh, the signal report too. So uh, it looks like I'm still getting out far and wide without uh, too many issues. Okay, uh, I'll just take one more quick listen on the frequency before closing down. This is VK3 EKH. All right, thanks everybody for uh, calling in tonight. Um, much appreciated. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yep, my count was right. Nine. <laughs> nine stations, so that's pretty good. I'm not complaining. Uh, to everybody there on the chat window, uh, Martin, Kim, uh, Richard, and, um, and uh, Nebs, and um, Joe, and uh, I think that's about all there is there that uh, came in on the chat window. Uh, Bruce, uh, Graham, <coughs> and that's it. Yep. Okay. If I missed anybody, sorry. Um, my mouse is playing up on that screen. It's a damn nuisance of a mouse. Doesn't want to, doesn't want to track properly. Uh, and uh, thanks everybody too for uh, sending the emails uh, tonight as well. Um, it's. Uh, always good. So this is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria. 
uh, concluding transmissions tonight and to everybody on the YouTube stream um, thank you for watching uh, I know there's uh, a few folks that uh, uh, view the uh, the YouTube stream a little bit later on not necessarily right now so I'm always impressed with the uh, the folks that like to catch up uh, with the broadcast later in some form so um, uh, all very good um, yeah so that's about it for me at uh, 3.34, sorry, 11.34. Uh, this is VK3EKH with VK3CSJ on the microphone, concluding for tonight. We bid everybody a very pleasant weekend, stay warm, and we'll see you next Friday. And uh, cheers to everybody on the Vision, uh, on VK3RTV as well. I uh, won't be dropping off there, I'll be staying there for a bit longer. But anyway, cheers everyone, take care. This is VK3EKH. All right. I'm not sure if uh, if Kim was saying something there to me or not. Just a little bit on the weak side, Kim. <coughs> anyway, I shall uh, shut the YouTube stream down, and uh, we'll uh, give that a rest too. So, uh, ASV Radio, VK3 EKH, uh, concluding with the service tonight on YouTube, and um, uh, thank you for watching, YouTubers.